considered the crescendo of all time. Were they the climax of all the events in history? We look at all of the great things that the Bible speaks about. And we read about God and the things that he's done. But how do we judge which miracles are the greatest? I mean, how do we scan history and all of the historical events of the Bible and come up with what we consider the most fantastic, miraculous, and extraordinary happenings that were ever written. When you think about it, it's mind-blowing. All the things that Jesus did that defy everything that this world is about three dimension. But you know what? When I talk about these things, if you recall, I spoke about how God will sometimes walk you through hard times to create in you a wonderful, powerful testimony. Amen. Amen? Amen. It's impossible for us to understand that as he walks us through these times, that it reminds us of all the great things that he has done so that we will be able to grasp that there is nothing that he can't do. Do you understand? Yeah. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, he walks us through these rough, crazy times in our lives when things get really rough. Why? Because he wants you to know, as he brings you through it, that there's nothing that he can't do. Yeah. I've had some rough times. Do you understand me? Yeah. The things that I went through, I pushed that basket out there homeless for two years. Hair completely out of control. Yeah. Hair was completely 
completely out of control, pushing around everything I own was out of a dumpster, wondering what happened to me, and God stayed with me. He stayed with me. And he got me through it. Why? Because he wanted me to know that there was nothing too great for him. And what did that do? That's caused me to put nothing but faith in him all the time now. I don't worry about nothing. My wife will tell you, I don't worry about nothing. God takes care of everything. Because you know what I found out? I found out that Jesus makes a door when there is no door. He makes a way when there is no way. You understand me? You ever find yourself in a position where you thought that everything was impossible? Yeah, and then all of a sudden, a door opens up and there you are. Everything is fine. It's a wonderful thing. Jesus does that. Jesus is the one. There is nothing that is beyond his reach. Matthew 19, 26 says, With people, these things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Amen? Amen. So there is nothing that he can't do. There is nothing that can defeat him, not even death. And you know when I think about that, that not even death can defeat him? Do you know how much comfort that gives me? I can be up here at this pulpit, and I'm going to tell you right now. When I go, I want to go right here. I want to be preaching the Word of God. And when I'm preaching it, I want to hit a big, big crescendo. And, <laughs> and down I have to go. Because you know why? It ain't going to bother me. I don't want it to bother you. I want you guys to celebrate my life. Amen? Amen. But the reason why it doesn't bother me is because I know that if Jesus wants to, he can step out and challenge and say, hey, get up. And I'll get right up. But I'll tell you what, even if I don't get up on this side, I'm already getting up on the other side. Amen? Amen. And this I know for a fact. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight or today. Now, when we remember the resurrection of Lazarus, we see Jesus standing outside the tomb, right? He has just asked them to roll away the stone. He rolled away, they rolled around, rolled away the, the stone that was brought in the entrance. And then Jesus was shouting out loud with a loud voice. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Ooh, that was dramatic. Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth just like this, wrapped in his clothes. Because he was all wrapped up in his burial clothes. He, he wasn't walking too good. You know. But Lazarus came on out. And everybody was watching. Everybody was looking and seeing what was going on. It, it, it was, can you imagine if you would have been standing there watching this? Now this, in my opinion, was one of the greatest miracles that I have ever heard. I mean, parting the Red Sea was absolutely marvelous. And healing the sick, bringing back sight to the blind, was absolutely ground shaking. But when you raise someone from the dead, whoo, that's a game changer. You know what I mean? That is a game changer. That tells me, you know, that tells me that there is nothing that can happen to me. Thank you, sweetheart. That there is nothing that can happen to me that God can't fix. Amen? As long as we're living, and actually even if we die, there's nothing that God can't take care of. Who would not want that? Don't you want that? Don't you want that? Yes. Yeah. All of us, we want to be up. If, if God can take care of any problems that we have, don't you want that? Yes. What about you, bro? You want that? You just going to stare at me? <laughs> Sorry, we'll talk after two. Anyway, God can fix it, amen? But I can't help but notice that there is one thing wrong with what we just witnessed in the resurrection of Lazarus. One thing wrong. What do you think that that was? Let me share it with you. As we go on reading the account in John 12, 9 through 11, it says that the large crowd of the Jews then learned that Jesus was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they may also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death also. Whoa! 
Wait a minute. They plan to put Lazarus to death also? Now, didn't Lazarus just die and Jesus brought him back? This is an issue. Because on account of him, they wanted to put him to death. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and they were believing in Jesus. So the Pharisees, they wanted to put not only Jesus to death, they wanted to kill Lazarus again. He wanted him to die twice here. Yeah. So, this presents a problem for me. Can you imagine? Here you are, like Lazarus, just been raised from the dead. And now you've got to worry about someone who is looking for you in order to introduce you to death all over again. It does something. Can you, can you believe that? I would be upside. I'd be sitting there and, and I'd be saying, oh, no, no thanks. No, we're, we've already met. I, I don't, I'm not willing to go back that direction. I don't need to know death again. Amen? That, doesn't that make sense to you? So even though the raising of Lazarus was fantastic and miraculous in itself, doesn't it seem like things are about to get a little redundant? And he's getting ready to go back to this again? I mean, if I was Lazarus, I'd be saying, oh, come on now. Haven't we done this already? Have we done this? I mean, I've been there and I've done that. And it was no picnic. That ain't no fun. That is no fun. I would be saying to those chief priests, come on guys, just leave me alone and let me live out my life. Now that it has been given back to me, I've got a second chance, so just let me die of old age. You know? But these guys, they want to play a shortcut, just go ahead and kill them right away. But it doesn't look like they're going to let that happen. They're not going to let that happen. So with all that is about to take place, don't you think Lazarus is thinking to himself, man, what a bummer. This is a drag. Here I am, just raised from the dead, and now I got to run around and run away just to stay alive. What would you do, Tracy? Would that be messed up if that was you? I mean, here you are, you just got raised from the dead, now somebody's looking for you again. Uh, yeah, I bet you can run too, huh? Yeah. yeah. I'm telling you. <laughs> so, Lazarus, he might have been thinking that, that whole thing about, you know, well, I've just been dead. I've just dead, just raised. And that way, he would not have experienced it again if you're sitting there thinking to himself, well, you know, maybe it was better for me. I'd have just stayed dead. Stay dead and raise me up later on. Amen? The resurrection of Lazarus, Jeff understand, it was not necessarily just for him. It was not necessarily just for him. But it was for the glory of God. Jesus wanted to show us that nothing was beyond him, beyond him not even death. Now let me tell you something. There is nothing in this universe that is more sword I'm looking for. There's nothing in this universe that is that, that happens to us that is more definite than death. When you die, now a lot of times the people out there they think, well that's it, that's the end of it. We as Christians though we know better, don't we? We know that this is not the end. But even though we know it's not the end, it has such a, a definite thing in the outcome. It's just here you are, you're gone. One minute you was here, the next minute you're gone. But you know what? We don't have to worry about that. Because what Jesus is actually showing us, and this is why he let a lot of things happen, was so that he could, he would witness to us today of who he is, who he is, and what he is all about. Amen? Amen. So what makes raising someone from the dead so special if he's going to die again? Other than the fact that God is the only one that can do it. Well, that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. Turn your Bibles to Luke 24. We're going to read 1 through 12. Let's stand, please, for the reading of the Word of God. Luke 24. 1 through 12. You guys got your... Uh, you got your Mac 10 with you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
Luke 24, 1 through 12. Give me an amen when you're ready. Amen. Okay, I'm not too bad. Let's give it another second. Give me an amen when you're ready. Amen. Yeah, that's not too bad. All right. Word of God says. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. Now, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you what we're reading about here. This is not about Lazarus. This is about Jesus because we want to know how special these resurrections were. Verse 2. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothes. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again? And they remembered his words and returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now, they were, there, they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James. Also, the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. But these words appeared to them as nonsense and they would not believe. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen wrappings only, and he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. Let's be seen. Can you imagine it? If you can place yourself there, let your imagination flow, and place yourself right there with the apostles, and everybody's coming back and telling you these dazzling, these guys with dazzling clothes came. They, they, they showed up and they told him that Jesus was living, even though they knew that he was put to death. Can you imagine the excitement that must have raised up in her heart? I sit there and I try to put myself there so that I could experience that feeling that they had when they were, something, when they were told that Jesus was alive. Amen? Yeah. So as we can see, it's one thing for Jesus to be able to raise someone from the dead. Okay? But who raised from the dead. You understand what I'm saying? That is quite another thing. Who raised Jesus from the dead? Well, John 10, 18 says, and this is Jesus speaking, he says, no one has taken my life away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to understand, Jesus didn't need no help. He was God in flesh form. The commandment came from the Father. He was the Son, and He did it the way that the Father told Him to. So we need to know and understand, Jesus didn't need no help. He was doing what He was commanded to do. So Jesus, being God in the flesh, has the authority to lay His line down and take it up again. So we can see that there is something extremely special about this situation. Amen? But what is so special about this situation? Let's kind of tear it down a little bit so that we get it. Why is his own resurrection so much more special than the others that were performed? I mean, he raised Lazarus in Bethany, and according to Luke 7, 14, he raised the widow's son, and he also raised the daughter of Jairus, the synagogue official. So what was so special about his own resurrection? Let me tell you something. One of the things that happened with everybody that Jesus raised from the dead, they all died again. Every last one of them. So you'd be wondering, well, what was that all about? You know, what's up with that? Well, what was so special about Jesus' resurrection was the fact that everyone else died. Like I said, Jesus raised him from the dead. They all just died again. Their resurrection was temporary. 
They were done to prove a point, ladies and gentlemen, and it was to teach us something. Remember, according to Romans 15, 4, all things have been recorded and put down in writing for our instruction. Do you understand? Let me tell you, you see, a lot of times we don't realize how fortunate we are. I used to sit there and think, wow, I've, wow, I've just been back there with John the Baptist and, and Peter and all the apostles. Man, that would have just been great. But you know what? Then I would have not been able to learn about all the stuff that happened since then. The Bible has everything recorded down in here that God wanted you to know to teach you about history, to teach you about God moving and how he has done everything that he's done, to bring everything to what? To where he wants it to be, now that it's removed towards the end. We, you and I, have an opportunity to learn and to know history in its form. And not only history past, but history to come. Amen? So the Gospels were written for our instruction. And what were they teaching us? That nothing is impossible for God. That's what he wants you to understand. Do you know what I'm saying? He wants you to know that. That there's nothing that he can't do. There's no situation that he can't make better. Case in point. Although Jesus was able to raise people from the dead, it was always temporary. Everyone that he raised from the dead back then died again. But who is to say that Jesus can't raise someone from the dead and give them a body that can never die? Give them a body that can never die. In fact, that is exactly what he did. And that is why his resurrection was so special. Because according to Romans 8, 29, he is the first of many brethren. Now, wait a minute. What does that mean, the first of many brethren? So when I look at all the great things that God has done, I believe that the second greatest miracle that God has ever done is the resurrection of the dead. Wait a minute. I said second. Did I say second? Restoring one's life after they have expired? The bringing back of that life and allowing it to once again breathe fresh air and feel their heartbeat beating right through their chest? It's only second grade. Whoa. What's wrong with Pastor Tony? Has he lost his mind? <laughs> But if you notice, like I said, it was the second greatest. So what is the first? What is the first? Well, let me tell you. When we read that Jesus is the first of many brethren, what is that talking about? What it's talking about is that Jesus was the first to be resurrected with a glorified body. Do you understand? A glorified body. A body that cannot get sick. A body that cannot get old. A body that cannot die. Period. Amen. He is eternal in his being. He has a body that can never die, never get sick, never grow old. It is a body that can do all of the things that Jesus did after his resurrection. That's what we're waiting for. We're waiting for because he is the first of many brethren. Guess what? I want to be the second. You want to be third? <laughs> <laughs> we want to be, listen, we got bodies coming that we are going to be just like him. You understand? To be able to do everything that he could do. That's what we're looking for. That's what's coming. Revelation 1, 17, 18 says, When I saw him, and this is Paul, I'm, I'm sorry, John talking. John is talking to Jesus. He says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys. Death and Hades. Now what does that mean? The keys to death and Hades. Have you thought about that? 
I have the keys to death and Hades. It means, ladies and gentlemen, that since Jesus has the keys to death and Hades, he has the control over who lives and who dies. It also means that he is the one that decides who is going to receive a glorified body and who is not. Okay, if he's going to, going to receive a glorified body, it's going to be a body that can do everything that he did. That's why the Bible says that he is the first of many brethren. Because there's going to be a whole lot more of them when it comes time. If we, they think they're born again. Why? Because they come to church and they sit here. And they go through what they go to. But the problem is, is that they have not surrendered to Jesus and asked Christ to come in and into their hearts and become their Lord and Savior. They're still relying upon their own righteousness to get them in. And ladies and gentlemen, if you're trying to rely on your own right, on your own righteousness, what does the Bible say? Your righteousness is like filthy rags. No matter on your best day how good you are, you are worth nothing. I am worth nothing. You understand? That's why we have no room to be too proud. You know, being proud. I, I ain't proud, you know. I can't be proud. Why? Look at what I was. Look at what I did. All the stuff that I did, the penitentiary time, and all the stuff that I spent, only because, and I'm only not doing it because God loved me. And he led me and he, he saved me. He forgave me. I'm so crazy. I really am. That's why we need to walk with Jesus now. Stop putting it off. We need to be obedient now and learn to stay that way. We need to do as Paul did now and browbeat our bodies to get them straightened out. Browbeat our bodies of today into submission so that we will have a body of tomorrow that is glorified. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to stop fooling around. You need to stop messing around. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. Let me go ahead and step on some people's Stacy Adams. <laughs> Do you have it in your mind right now that after this wonderful church service, when you're done, you're going to get up and you're going to walk out that door and you're going to go and hook up with home girl or home boy. And you're going to enjoy the pleasures that marriage gives a person without being married. Is that what you plan on doing? That you have planned to get up and to leave out of here right after church service and do something that you ain't got no business doing. Is that your plan? get up from here and as soon as this church service is over and walk over here to 5th and San Julian or someplace and pick you up a little something something. A little chip. I ain't talking about chip and Dave, please. Is that what you got planned on doing? Because let me tell you something, if that's the case, you're just playing with God. This is not a real thing for you. In fact, if you got plans on doing that, why aren't you just home watching the game? Because you don't mean this. This is nothing that you mean. And if you think that you're fooling Jesus, <laughs> you're not. Jesus knows what you're doing. He knows all about you. Amen? If you're doing something like that, if that's what you think that you can do and that you're going to get away with it, don't even waste your time. You know, might as well be happy and merry for tomorrow. Drink, eat. What is that old saying? Drink, eat. For tomorrow you may not. So, what will be the benefits of having such a wonderful new body? What is that good for? Let's go over that just for a minute. Number one, we will have everlasting life. Everlasting life. Ladies and gentlemen, do you understand what that means? That means that you will never, ever die. That there will come a time in your life when you will be one million years old. Do you understand that? 
and you still don't be the victim. Your body will not have wrinkled, it will not have gotten sick, nothing. It will be. And, and no matter who tries to kill you, they can't. You're going to be that way. 1 John 5, 11 and 12 says, And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. That life is in His Son. He who has the Son has the life. And he who has not the Son of God has not the life. Ladies and gentlemen, that means that just like I told you in John the third chapter, you must be born again. That means that you must allow Christ to come into your heart. Because when God looks at you, He's going to see you with Christ in you. That's what saves you. If He sees you without Christ in you, you are through with money. You understand? You're done. That is it. And Jesus talks about that. When people think that they're saved and they're not. Jesus himself said, many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? And I will say to them, get away from me, you workers. Well, he won't do that part, but get away from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew. Yeah. Let me tell you something. I don't know about you. I don't want Jesus looking at me going, I don't know you. Right. No, not after all this. You know what I'm really? saying? I want to make sure that everything is taken care of. All my T's are crossed and all my eyes are done. Amen? Amen. Number two. Not only does he give us eternal life, but he also allows us to rule with him. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. This is the scripture that caused me and drew me to Jesus Christ. You want to know why? Because in this world, I didn't do anything right. Did you? No. Oh, that's why we're down here. <laughs> that's what we're doing. That's why a lot of us are doing what we're doing down here. Listen, I came out of high school. I was supposed to be the most likely to succeed. But you know what I was doing? Pushing my basket. <laughs> I succeeded in pushing this basket. You know, I succeeded to get stuff out of the dumpster. I decided, you know, all this stuff just messed my life up. Till I finally came to that day in the alley and I said to myself, what happened, Lord? I don't know what happened. And he was just waiting for that time. Because remember when I said earlier that he brings us through very hard times to teach us something? Many times he will bring you to your lowest point. You want to know why? Because if you ain't at your lowest point, you ain't ready to give up. You still, you still think you got some fight left in you. And as long as you got some fight left in you, guess what? Jesus is going to let you fight and struggle and twist and turn. All that stuff. You know when, you, when you're out there fishing and you catch one of them big swordfish and you fight with them and he's wiggling and carrying on and you're just tying them up. Why? So that you can pull them up on board, cut them up and have a good swordfish again. God is trying to wear you out if that's what's going on. I've listened to my brothers and sisters right out here in the street. I ain't ready. I ain't ready yet. I need to come up. I'm going to go ahead and come up. I've had people walk by me. They didn't see me. They saw me from behind. And I heard the brother talking. He said to the guy he was walking with, he says, Hey, I'm going to jump on this dude real quick. I'm going to go ahead and come up. And I turned around, getting ready to sock him. <laughs> just in case he came at me. Yeah. And he looked at me and went, Oh, that's just a black man. Leave him alone. He didn't want to jump on me because I was a black man. That's just crazy. That's crazy. You want to jump on people like that and just try to take what they got. You know? See, what he didn't understand is that I had angels around me. You know what I mean? And whatever he thought was a reason not to jump on me, the angels saw something different. Amen? Now, number three. No, first of all, I want to tell you something. I told you that he allows us to rule with him. This is something that really, really got me. I get an opportunity to rule with him. Listen, anybody in here, are you, are you uh, the president of AT&T? Are you? No? Uh, are you the CEO of Verizon? 
Uh, are you the president of Chase Bank? No? Well, we didn't do it right, did we? We didn't do it right. But let me tell you something, God has given you a second chance. And I refuse to let that get by me without taking full advantage of it, amen? He's telling you here that if you overcome, that you will be allowed to sit on his throne with him and rule with him. Listen, I don't know about you, but I want to do that, don't you? Don't you want to do that? Listen, I, I don't even care about at and Verizon. I don't even care about Chase Bank. Well, maybe a little bit, but anyway. <laughs> I don't even care about none of this stuff. Jesus is going to allow me to sit on his throne and rule with him. When you read about that in the Bible, you know what he says? He says, if you bring, you know, you he sends you out and you come back faithfully working and doing what he wants you to do, he's going to give you cities to rule over. Cities. Not just Chase Bank. Not just Verizon. He's going to give you a city. He says, in some cases, he says, you came back with 10 minutes, I'm going to give you 10 cities to rule over. But you know what? Let me tell you something. For you to be able to rule and to be the kind of ruler that you're supposed to be, Jesus has given you an opportunity to learn what he's all about now. You need to learn about what's going on now. That's one of the reasons why he wants you to be humble. He wants you to show humility now. Because the time is coming when you're going to sit on the throne with him. He doesn't want somebody up there that's, that's going. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that. That's right. I'm ruling this. <laughs> I'm running this show. No, no, no. That, that isn't what he wants you to do. To love your people. To love them. To love the cities that he gives you. Because you know why? Those are going to be his things. They're going to be his people. That's why he says in Revelation 3.21, he says, He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Do you see the promise he's given you? Don't you want that? Amen. It's time for us. Listen, don't, don't waste a promise like that because you can't control your flesh. What is that? Listen, I don't care how much you love him. I don't care how much he loves you. Don't do what James wants to do. Yeah, your flesh is going to watch. But hey, so stop it. Is it worth it? Let me put it in perspective for you. Eternity, 15 minutes of pleasure. Oh boy. Is it worth it? No. 15 minutes of bliss. Some of these brothers in here, oh man, 30 minutes. 30 minutes, is that worth it? 30 minutes of bliss? Eternity? No. It's not. We want to live our lives right. We want to live it like you got, like we, listen, I need to live my life like I got some sense. I need to have everything in perspective. Amen? I want Jesus Christ in my life. I love him. Man. I love him. That's what I love. And I want to do everything that he wants me to do. And I don't care what anybody else says. Amen? Amen. Now, number three, he gives us a future and a hope. What is that all about? Ladies and gentlemen, let me explain something to you. I had no future. Like I said, when I came out of high school, yeah, I was supposed to be the guy most likely, most likely to succeed. But I messed up everything with what? That white powder. That white powder did me in. And I had no future. I was, you know what my future was? Waiting to die. That's what my future was. I could only wait to die. That was what my future was. But God changed all of that. He got a hold of me. Brought me to my bottom. Made sure that I was finally at a place where I had no fight left in me. Amen. Listen. Use, use that old noodle that you got up here. You don't have to wait that long. Give up now. Give up now. Surrender now. Give your heart to Christ now. Amen. So that you don't have to get beat up so badly like I did. You don't have 
have to come to that thing. You just need to give up now. Give your heart to God and let Him have His way. And He will give you a future. Amen? Amen. And it will be a future beyond your wildest imagination. And then, on top of that, He gives you hope. He gives you hope. Ladies and gentlemen, what is that hope of? It's hope that goes beyond this life. And it's a hope that takes you into the next. Everlasting life. Eternity. And all of the promises of sitting on his throne with him. Amen? Amen. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. There are plans for good and not for disaster. To give you a future and a hope. God has got that plan for you. Don't mess that up. Number four. He gives us rest for our souls. Listen, you tell me, when you was messing up, when you was doing everything that you shouldn't have been doing, weren't you tired all the time? Yeah. I sure was. I was always tired. I could never, first of all, I was afraid to go to sleep. I was afraid to go to sleep because I thought somebody would come along and steal my package, my money. And a lot of us don't we even had people that we trusted. And they, and they were the ones that tried to steal it. We had no rest. But you know something, I had no rest. I had to sleep out in the bushes and behind the dumpsters and all that kind of stuff, trying to get some sleep where nobody would know where I was. It was terrible. But you know what? God when he got a hold of me, he gave me true rest. It wasn't the kind of rest that you get from sleeping or anything like that. It was a rest that I had, that I needed to, to know that everything was going to be okay. Amen? That life was going to be okay. That he was going to train me and change me and make it so everything was going to be okay. Amen? I know some of us, man, we've been living our lives, going through what we've been going through. And then when God gives you rest, he gives you rest and sometimes he even gives you a wife. He gives you a wife that just helps you rest, cooks you a good meal, rubs your back, tells you how much he loves you. Matthew 11, 28 and 29 says, Come to me all who labor and who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Do you notice that Jesus is saying he will give you rest? Nothing else. You could go ahead and that's why he tells us don't let anybody judge you about the Sabbath. Because the Sabbath was made to give people rest, right? But you see, the Sabbath might give you rest, but it's not rest that lasts. You get tired again. But Jesus is telling you, I will give you rest. Jesus is the one that gives you rest that stays with you all the time. He gives you peace. That is his and his alone that he gives you. Amen? Amen. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest in your souls, for your souls. So it's important for us to understand, ladies and gentlemen, that Jesus is the answer to all the rest issues. When you're tired, you just can't get it together, Christ has got you. All you got to do is just pray to me and tell the Lord, I'm tired. Will you please hand it to me and take over? And he will. Number five, he will give us renewed strength. What is that talking about? Well, in Isaiah 40, it says, Yet those who wait on the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles, and they will run and not get tired. And they will walk and not become weary. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know about you, but I would love to be able to run and not get tired. You know what I mean? I mean, I can run a little bit right now. I'm 62 years old. I can run a little bit, but I can't run that far. But I'll tell you what, I can run a little bit farther if the police is after me. <laughs> I can almost read your mind. This pastor's a mess. <laughs> see, see, I share that with you because we all know what that's like at one time or another, isn't it? Sometimes you just got to book. Anyway, 
Oh, this thing's that. But I mean, you know what? See, I would love for God to give me a body. He's trying to tell you something here. He's going to give you a body that you can run and you just don't get tired. You can run. I have only met one woman in my life or one person in my life that can run like that and not get tired. That's right, Angel. <laughs> I never seen nothing like it. Angel took off down the street, running after this woman that stole her top. She ran down the street. I was like, look at this. <laughs> she ran, and then she ran. She said, oh, no, she went down that way. She turned left and started going down that way. I never, and just ran full, I mean, ran full speed. Yeah, yeah, for an hour, man, just kept on going. I'll tell you what. Don't steal no sweater from that sister. I'm gonna tell you. You, you will not be able to get away. Amen. And you know what? We got that sweater back, didn't we? Yes, we did. She ran while I was driving. I wasn't crazy. Yeah. And Angel's the only one I know who already got her glorified body. <laughs> Oh, but it was amazing, man. That was an amazing night. But you know what? We need to understand. God has got that all waiting for you. It's a gift. Listen, if you could do that now in this body, just think what you're going to be able to do when the time comes and He gives you your energy. Amen? It's going to be amazing. I want to get a camera. Go ahead and film. That girl can run. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, number six. It says that He promises to love us forever. And that nothing will ever separate us from that love. Ladies and gentlemen, do you realize how important this is? You have, listen, we all live our lives wondering how long is love yeah. going to be with you? How long is my person of interest, my, my significant other, are they ever going to fall out of love with me? And sometimes it happens, doesn't it? You think that you've got a relationship that's going to last, and all of a sudden she kicks you to the curb. Because she don't think that you're worth it anymore. Jesus is telling us that he will never kick you to the curb. He will never, ever stop love and ever change that. Romans 8, 38, 39 says, For I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from the love of God. Neither death or life, neither angels or demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Amen. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God. Amen. That is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We need to understand, ladies and gentlemen, that through Jesus Christ, the love that God has given us, think about, think about this. I'm sorry, I just got excited. <laughs> Think about this. God gave you love that is so deep that it exists and is revealed in Jesus Christ himself. And so how did he give it to you? He gave you Jesus Christ himself. He is the one that is placed in your heart. God gave him to you. That's how Wonderfully together, he has shown us his love. I'm so appreciative. I love him so much for that. That I don't have to ever worry about that. Amen. Amen. So in conclusion, we need to always keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, that God has something really special in store for us. And that he has given us little clues as to what it is. His resurrection and the promise that we will have that same kind of resurrection that we will inherit all that Christ has according to his riches. Romans 8, 22 and 23 says, For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. The whole world is groaning while we wait. We wait for Jesus Christ to return and to give us what it is we need. And let me tell you something. 
I've been saved now for about 27, 28 years. I'm waiting for Christ to come back. But that 27, 28 years went by like a flash. It was gone so fast. All I'm trying to tell you is that I believe personally that Jesus is coming back so fast it's going to be like a flash. That before you know it, he's going to be here. So what does that mean? That means don't mess around. Don't, don't sin against him. Give your heart to Christ. Let him have his way in your life. Let him help you. Amen? Because it's not going to be that long. So what is so special about Jesus' resurrection? The ultimate question. Because Jesus' resurrection was a cut above anything else that we ever dreamed of. And we will experience that same kind of resurrection making us the brethren spoken of in Romans 8.29. What does that say? Romans 8.29 says, For those that he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn of many brethren. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is the first of his kind. But when we see him, we will be like him. My name is Anthony Stallworth and I'm a senior pastor at Central City Community Church of the Nazarene. We're located at 419 East 6th Street, downtown Los Angeles, on the corner of 6th and San Pedro. We are a church that serves the Skid Row community, so I'm sure that you can imagine that it's difficult for us to support our ministry with the tithes and the offerings. If today's message has helped you, perhaps you would like to come alongside Central City and prayerfully consider helping support this ministry by sending your tax-deductible gift to Central City Community Church. P.O. Box 13273, Los Angeles, California, 90013.